Time now is 25 minutes to one, and we welcome into the studio my super guest of the day, all the way from Burnham on Sea, one of the West's premier seaside resorts. It's Michael Turner. Hello, Michael. Lovely to see you, Steve. And uh, Michael's coming to tell us about what he's been up to over the last couple of years. He's an international traveller, 80 countries over the last 40 years. Is it, is it more than 80 now, or are you up to 80? It's at least 80 uh, because it gets a bit tricky because some people add on overseas dependencies. Exactly. And, and see, countries can change, can't they? I mean, you could say you've gone to Yugoslavia, but Yugoslavia is split up into other countries these days. Uh, yes, that's right. You see, you can go to Chile, and I'm going back to East Dryland next Easter. You fly five hours across the South Pacific, and you're still in Chile. Extraordinary. Well, before we talk about your travel, let's just talk a little bit more about your background to start with. Now, these days you work as a supply teacher and you've dipped in and out of teaching over the years and you've taught at several different places. Physical education, is that your principal thing that you teach? I know you also teach Spanish as well. What would you say is your is your best subject that you're... you're... While I'm 60 years old and I <sighs> joke to the children that I'm the world's oldest PE teacher... You've you only got to tell them what to do. You haven't got to do it yourself, though, have you? Well, I've got to inspire them. You see, when I was at school, the PE teachers were often... Uh, figures of fear because they we, we had these medicine balls you had to run around with them you had shirts and skins and it was all quite hard and if you didn't do it well you got dapped I and mean, you can't punish the children in the way that they used to teachers are far more friendlier and caring towards te children than they've ever been yeah just as well you've enjoyed your career as a teacher over 33 you? years and mm. i go to work full of enthusiasm every day yeah you've also taught spanish as i mentioned over the years how, how did you come to learn spanish originally well i had to learn spanish to hire boats helicopters aeroplanes documenting francis drake's voyages uh, in latin america yeah. so i first started learning arabic because i was visiting the bedouins in the sinai desert in their tents and i was so enthralled with their unchanged way of life since the time of moses and i just wanted to speak to people in different circumstances that we're not used to in this country have you got a talent for learning languages do you think or has it been a struggle for it's you it's a mighty struggle i'm studying two pages of spanish every day to finish this 800 page book before i go back to chile next easter now also interestingly you worked for a time at a camp for obese children in the usa well where they invented obesity and of course it's been a problem there for many years and you, you've got a background as a, as a physical education teacher what what were you doing at that camp? I wanted to gain more experience in working overseas. I travelled overseas hitchhiking and roughing it, but I was looking for a career. I was in and out of different jobs and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I kept meeting these students on gap years and I joined in going to Camp America. And I was put on an obese camp. I thought, oh no, I'm a fitness fanatic. I want to work with very athletic children but I realized that I was in a niche area of life which was absolutely educational and I went back for more summers and did you make much progress with the larger children one boy came back and said Michael inspired me to keep this weight off and many of them didn't because you could see that because halfway through summer camp on the fourth weekend mum and dad would take out their achieving child who lost a lot of weight and they'd be celebrating with cheesecakes so you thought well how effective is this going well, to be? Well it must be hard particularly in America where the food is often uh, laden with sugar and fat and there's so many temptations and a lot of sort of idleness and game playing isn't there on the video games and Yes, but there weren't any video games back in the 1970s oh, right. and 80s television that I channels. There. Yes, they, they just dreamt of food they couldn't have, such as peanut butter sandwiches. Oh, God, well, we wish them well. Uh, you've also done other things, including cycling from John O'Groats to Land's End for charity. What was the charity you were raising money for on that occasion? I was the first Burnham on Sea resident ever to make this journey by bicycle. It was in 19... Gosh, tell me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 1979. Start off in March in the snow in Scotland, and I raised money for the Burnham on Sea Bass Ground, a sports club down at the bottom of Stodden's Road. How long did it take you to do it? was nine and a half days but the trouble is i've been a physical fitness fanatic since i was 17 and in those days when i ran a marathon or swam to steer island or canoe to bridgewater and back or cycled i had no one to consult and i cycled on an ordinary average quality road bike and the spokes kept snapping because of the weight of the panniers yeah and I had to keep going into cycle shops and cycling back towards the town I'd just left or hitchhike back to get the spokes repaired. But so nine, it was really nine, difficult. nine days is pretty good going, though. Nine and a half, yeah. It was, it was. 
it was a sensational experience. I recommend it to everybody yeah. to do it. I suppose going from Scotland down the Land's End is downhill, though, isn't it? Yeah, but it's against the wind. <clears throat> now, also, interestingly, you wrote the biographical text for Neil Sedaka's 1995 tour programme. In fact, you met Neil Sedaka. How did the Neil Sedaka connection come about? I heard his songs in his comeback years in the early 70s when I was a teenager and I saw him in concert a few times. I arrived at a concert hall in Eastbourne too early and I actually managed to get into the auditorium because the front door was open. I sat there watching him rehearse but he took no notice of me. So I ran behind stage chasing him and I got into his dressing room to introduce myself to him. I was a fireman at the time and he said, oh, I couldn't do your job. So I've been going to fan club conventions and shows and in America, on the overweight camp, one, some of the children there were related to him. And they told me about his mother-in-law who lived down the road. And she used to see me on her days, on my day off, and with her husband. And when I was visiting her later on in New York City, Neil knew I was there and he came round to see me and he spent an hour and a half with me. And I interviewed him, which I got on CD. He's actually singing songs to me. And he asked me to write his 1995 concert tour of Great Britain. And I was thrilled, but I'd never written anything musically because I only admire music. So I was writing Neil put in a G minor chord change. I didn't know what it meant, but I put it into the book because I was listening to his radio interviews and I went through my record collection. Anyway, since then, I've written a 20,000 word book and I've given it to him. And he lent it to an author and I've been quoted six times in a big biography which came out last year well he seems like a delightful man i've seen him in documentaries in the past and of course he's got the golden touch he's written some beautiful songs hasn't he 800 songs and i've got the biggest collection in the world of his songs gosh i've got songs he never released plus versions in foreign languages and also that year i was with him in new york city in his mother-in-law's flat i spent an hour and a half in gene pitney's house a few days before wow well neil sadaka didn't just write songs for himself he's supplied songs to other artists didn't he over the years here's a great story last year i was hitchhiking through paraguay and Neil Sedaka told me in his interview, and he sung the song to me, his famous song that he liked in a foreign language was Recuerdos de Ipacaray. I don't know that And one. I went to Ipacaray Lake in Paraguay, and I found out where the daughter of the composer lived. And I went round her house, she invited me, and she showed me the museum of her father's works, and lo and behold, it was Neil Sedaka records and newspaper cuttings of him in Buenos Aires and she was absolutely touched when she knew that Neil Sedaka said her father wrote the loveliest song that he'd recorded in a foreign language. Gosh, that's an example of synchronicity, everything sort of coming together. Well, let's talk about your travels then. This December you celebrate 80 countries in 40 years, more or less. It could be more countries than that. Let's talk about the travel bug. When did it start? As a child, did you start becoming a traveller? Well, I'm utterly restless, as you can see right now. I have a but job did, keeping did you, still. <laughs> did you go on conventional childhood holidays with your family? And only to Plymouth. I didn't come from a family that had a lot of money. And in those days, few people ever went abroad back in the 60s. I was inspired by a teacher at King Alfred School, the late Roy Ladd. He taught RE and art, mm -hmm. and he lived in Australia. And he was always lacing his lessons with stories about tribes of people living in the South Pacific. And I knew as a 13-year-old, I must see the world. In my naivety, I just conjured up the idea of sailing around the world. Then I was a restless fireman, and sub-officer Richard White said to me, if I were your age, I'd be kicking a ray around the world. So what I did that winter to see if I could do it, I slept on the pavement at Penzance bus station to see if I could rough it. Then I hitchhiked round France Italy and Switzerland December sleeping in the mountains in sheds in the snow see if I could rough it and survive living off instincts you could have killed yourself well I've had some rough experiences since then I've been knifed in the ear strangled unconscious I've been put in jail three times Blimey. well we're talking more detail about those in a moment but let's move on to Sir Francis Drake because you've been I would use the word obsessed by Sir Francis Drake for a number of years how did your interest in the great man begin I wouldn't say I was obsessed, because if you thought well, I, I was would. a professor... I, I would, actually, Michael, because you travelled the world in his footsteps, 
something that only an obsessive would do. Well, if I were a professor, you'd say I was highly specialised. This morning, <laughs> this morning, I had a book arrive from the Canary Islands. They're celebrating how they repulsed Drake on the island of La Palma. How could they do something like and that? And this, this is the second time they sent me a book, and lo and behold, they've referenced me all the way through the book. Well, they book. couldn't repulse you, could you? So tell us about Sir Francis Drake. What is it about him that appealed to you initially? I was flabbergasted that all his achievements and adventures and his innovative buccaneering all belonged to the life of one man. And when I heard these stories at St Andrew's Junior School in Burnham-on-Sea and throughout secondary school at King Alfred, I was hooked upon Drake. And I read about him, and by coincidence, fate had it that I was at the fortress in Veracruz, Mexico, where the Spanish massacred nearly all of Drake's fleet. And I was so excited that I was on the same piece of turf as my schoolboy hero by coincidence that I said, right, I shall put an objective into world travel to go everywhere that Drake went because no one else in the world's doing it. Now, a lot of people listening now will be familiar with the name Sir Francis Drake, but they'll know little about him. In a nutshell, can you just sum up what he did that's so impressive? Yeah, he was the first Englishman who was a privateer in the Caribbean Sea, the West Indies. He robbed the Spanish mule train in its weakest link between the mines of Potosi in Bolivia to the treasure house in Seville, Spain, where the treasure crossed the isthmus to be loaded onto ships in Nombre de Dios. He was the first Englishman to sail around the world and he helped defeat the Spanish Armada and he was a great civic leader and he married a woman in Somerset from Monk Silver, Coombe Sydenham and we know that Drake went to Bridgewater so which is in my forthcoming book. Yeah, in fact, you've is it several books on Drake, haven't you, over the years? Three have been published, plus we have a booklet out which has sold 2,450 copies in three years. Why don't you think Drake is more celebrated? I mean, his name is known, but he's not celebrated that much, is he? Well, he was linked to the slave trade in his early years, but he was Who first... wasn't at the time? That's right, good point, but he was the first Englishman to work with black people on equal basis of rights and camaraderie. I think people like to denigrate people from previous generations who don't have the moral thinking that we have today. How did he meet his end? We are dysentery in Panama, and I've been the closest to his coffin. We've not found it yet, but every time I go to Panama, I do dive around the area. So you think his coffin is still there to be found? Oh, yes, because it's made of lead, and the current is only about two nautical miles an hour, so nothing's moved. We we found wreckage on the seabed over there, such as cannonballs and cannons so most items are still in place well over the last 40 years or so then you've uh, traveled in drake's footsteps and in fact you can uh, look at uh, the website in drakeswake.co.uk for more details you've traveled to all these countries let's just dip into the the experiences you've had over the years you principally hitchhike though don't you when you move around yes i do because i hate looking out of dirty windows in buses with curtains i could be sitting in the aisle seat and in some buses like in nepal everybody is stuffed in and you be come very shut in and can't see the world. It's also moving. cheaper when you hitchhike, isn't it? Yes, I was in Angola this year. Yeah, tell me about that. That sounds amazing. 620 miles, and you describe it as the most difficult and expensive country in Africa. There's no tourism there, apparently. Well, it's the 12th most corrupt country in the world, which I've never said until now, and I had a terrible introduction. When I landed at the airport, I had to go to the other terminal, which was only a kilometre away, and I was charged £30 because the meter was rigged for me, so it was spinning. When I complained to a policeman, he did nothing. <laughs> Tell so me a bit about Angola, the then. What's it like as a country? Well, you get a great sense of isolation when you're there, because no tourism. And I did a video there for my YouTube channel, Turner's Travels, which I use for lessons, because Angola's in the first stage. There are no tourist infrastructure at all. The British Embassy confirmed I was the only British traveller they'd ever met. So what's putting off the tourists? The fact that there's no infrastructure? Or well, is it just dangerous? There's not a lot to see in some countries. I went through a spell where I said I want to go to countries where there's nothing to see. So I went to Djibouti and Eritrea and Sudan. Well, back to Angola. A great sense of isolation. I don't speak Portuguese. They understand my Spanish, but I don't respond to the replies because I don't understand. 
And when I flew in, everyone on the plane was from Vietnam or China. They're all workers. They're all expatriates who go to Angola. And it's hugely expensive. I think it's the most expensive country in the world. And I call it expensive poverty because you're paying 40 quid for a night in a hotel. You can fill every spring in the mattress. The water's dribbling out of the taps and you've got to tip water over you in lieu of a shower. But you travelled over 600 miles there. Yeah, because what I like about some of these countries like Paraguay last year, once you get out of towns, you travel for scores of miles and hardly see anybody. So people are travelling massive distances. When I hitchhike in Chile this Easter, it'll be the same. I'll be going through the world's driest desert. No one will be stopping for hundreds of miles when they pick you up. Well, you've had a lot of trouble over the years. You've been jailed, you've been knifed, you've been in danger. What, what was the moment out of all your uh, travelling where you felt most endangered? Well, once we were, dry, we were diving for Drake's coffin and my demand valve broke and it floated off and the water was black and I couldn't see anything and I just opened my mouth, my mouth with surprise. Luckily, I could find the other one by feel and I didn't panic, otherwise I would have drowned. But I have had my ear slashed with a switchblade in Colombia. How did that happen? Were you being mugged, were you? Yeah, I was. It was half past nine in the morning and I was strangled from behind and all blood was squirting all over my shirt. Dear. And they just relieved me of my watch and camera gear. And you were left unconscious somewhere, weren't you? Yes, I was unconscious in Nairobi at half past eight on a Saturday night. Were well, you whacked on the back of the head? Thieves or? followed me, and they waited till I got to a block in the main road where the street light wasn't working. And I was strangled unconscious, and I was frisked for everything I had on me. Not much, but I did lose a watch and some money. Why don't you just go to Butlins at Minehead? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because I've got a retort for you like I always like to have stored for you. I used to be a chalet porter and a lifeguard at Pontins at Breen Sands oh, yes. when I was 17 and 19 years old. So I have sampled that. Okay. Thank you. Now you've met a few great names over the years. You were the first tourist to meet Nelson Mandela after his release from jail in 1990 and you were only there by chance weren't you? Yeah, I saw him released from prison on the Sunday, and the following Friday I, I flew to South Africa. But you made the plucky decision to go and see if you could see him. Yes, I'd finished draking on the coastline and flew back to Johannesburg, and this white man suddenly started talking to me as we landed, and he offered to put me up overnight, and he said, Prince, my driver, is at your disposal in the morning? I said, can I go to Nelson's house, please? So we arrived, and there this 15-year-old youth at the garden gate. And I said, I'd like to meet Nelson, please, because I'm a school teacher and we teach about apartheid. And I've got some human rights booklets I've had published. Please, can you let me in? He says, oh, Nelson's busy. I said, but I need some help with my lessons. I said, I'll go and get the booklets to show you. He said, all right, come on in. And I was the only person in the garden who was not in the media. And I didn't know I was doing something wrong, actually, because when Nelson came out for a photo shoot on the veranda of his bungalow, everybody was silent. And I piped up, I said, excuse me, Mr Nelson Mandela, you're my hero, please I have my photograph taken you with you. You broke protocol, protocol, didn't you, really? Yeah, because no one speaks, and I didn't know this, I'm not a member of the media. And he says, you've just become my hero, come here. And everybody burst out laughing, so it broke the ice. And I had my arm around his shoulder and shook his hand, and I didn't realise what I'd done. The whole world press was photographing me, and Mike Walbridge from the BBC commandeered me for an interview. I met David Dimbleby there. When I got home, the press were waiting for me. I think that was the most exciting day of my life, meeting one of the world's greatest personalities ever to have trod this planet. Well, he was just a lovely bloke. He had a warmth to him, didn't he? Oh, well, I made him laugh straight away. He did have a warmth and a sense of humour and a great retort to say that I've just become his hero come here. So he turned a form formal situation into something that was quite relaxing. Now let's mention Mother Teresa, because you knocked on the door of her convent, didn't you? I was teaching humanities, which is my second strength, in a school in Gosport, and the head of department gave us a pile of work for next term. And I just happened to be going to India, and Mother Teresa was on the teaching schedule. So I flew to Calcutta just in case I could find her. I thought, if I don't find her, I'll see why she's there, see the dying destitutes on the streets. And I knocked on a convent door, a nun answered the door, said, come on in, and Mother Teresa spent an hour and a half with us. Wow. And she actually prayed with me. She forced her prayer book in front of me, and I've got it all on CD, us praying together, and my interview with her. What's been your toughest trip over the years? Ah, uh, no one's ever asked me that. Oh, dear. I've had a great trip, like, hitchhiking across the USA. I was hitchhiking through Mexico, and I'd run out of food. And also in Peru, I was ill. 
and miracles happened. When I had run out of food, there was no banks to cash traveller's checks in the jungle on Sunday, and a van came along stuffed with cakes. And when we got to the Pacific coastline, they bought me an evening meal, and in Peru when I was ill, I dreamt of lying in the back of a vehicle on a mattress so I could travel and get better at the same time because I couldn't stop because I had thousands of miles to cover in the Andes. And lo and behold, a van came, French couple, mattress in the back, and they propped me up on the mattress for two days and I just lie on my back looking out the window. They, that it was a miraculous deliverance from difficulty. Now I spoke to you briefly before you came on air and we were talking about the joy of travel and the way that tr travel is educational, it teaches you to understand things and make connections in your own mind. Travel is the best vehicle for education. The only drawback is, as someone once pointed out, it's diffuse. My next door neighbour, Cyril, has been patting me on the back since he moved in. I really appreciate his respect for my achievements. I don't get a lot of pats on the back, but I appreciate some people who've never travelled far having an empathy for what the traveller's gone through. I like to talk to people about travelling around the world to inspire them. People say that I'm worldly. And as a person, I like to be known purely for my travels. Well, you are also a photojournalist, and many of your photos have been used in brochures and guidebooks, haven't they? And on television, yes. The first one appeared when a geography lecturer at Teacher Training College asked me for pictures for his book. They were in black and white, they weren't very good quality, but it was a start. And I've been lucky to have some pictures published because I had a couple of stark comments given to me in the 1970s. Your last trip is just a memory and you go to the next place, so what? And I thought, well, I've got to rise above those comments. And I'm very pleased I heard those comments because with my YouTube channel, Turner's Travels, I now put videos on for teaching children and to show the world where I've been and BurnhamOnSea.com runs features on my travels and I tell people who pick me up around the world tune into BBC or BurnhamOnSea.com and you'll be able to read about this journey that you helped me so kindly during my travel through your country. Now is the website in Drake's Wake still up and running? Yes, that's expanding all the time and Michael Turner YouTube channel with a playlist called Turner's Travels is the reason why I'm going back to Easter Island and Chile purely to do exciting videos and I'm going back to the world's longest swimming pool which I swam five years ago. Where's that? It's in Chile, it's five-eighths of a mile long and I'm going to swim a length of it on video and I'm going to promote physical fitness for life and for the over 60s. Blimey, well you've always been a keen swimmer haven't you? You've swum an awful lot and you've done quite a lot of endurance events over the years. I've swum for 41 years, two or three kilometres a week and I swam from Burnham on Sea to Steer Island the bank many years ago. Blimey, how'd you put up with the cold? That was it. I was shrunk when I got out of the water. I was, I was shriveled up. It was very, very cold in June. I bet when you get back to Burnham on Sea, when you've been on a particularly tough trip, like the one to Angola that you had that not that long ago, you appreciate the luxuries which we take for granted. I live in a very well-appointed home, so one journalist published. So when I leave home with the rucksack, I want to get completely away from luxury and take a chance because everything's predicted every day in comfort and I like to rough it and to expand the personality and to gain the confidence that is attributed to backpacking around the world especially to the most unusual countries because recently I've had a great time in Tibet, Oman and China. I'm not very easily impressed these days but those countries are recent and I thoroughly recommend people to visit that part of the world. Do you think it's a shame that they don't stamp the, the, the passports like they used to? I know they do in some places, but they don't put the colourful stamps on as they used to, perhaps, you know, in the 1950s or earlier than that. In some countries, I've asked for a stamp, and they've given me a stamp. I even went overboard once when I got on a ferry in Plymouth asking for an exit fee so they leave my own country. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it said by request in the passport. OK, well, what a pleasure to meet you today, Michael. We wish you well. Let's hope we don't get into any difficulty. Are you going to keep on travelling, you know, as you get older and older? I've got journeys planned for next year. I'm going to Victoria Falls, Albania, Chile. From with a Saga cruise? Not old enough at 60. Fair enough. Well, what a pleasure to meet you again today. Thank you so much for coming in, Michael. If people want more details, they can look at the website indrakeswake.co.uk or your YouTube channel, which is Turner's Travels. Yeah, as a playlist.
thank you very much for coming in. A true delight, thank you. That's uh, Michael Turner, the international traveller and teacher. Across the West on FM, DAB and online. This is BBC Radio Bristol.